Hello, my name is Eric Wilson. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Bible is their constitution, that all of their beliefs, teachings, and practices are based on the Bible. I know this because I was brought up in that faith and promoted it throughout the first 40 years of my adult life. What I didn't realize, and what most Witnesses do not realize, is that it isn't the Bible that is the basis of Witness teaching, but rather the interpretation given to Scripture by the governing body. That is why they will blindly claim to be doing God's will while carrying out practices which to the average person seem cruel and completely out of step with the character of a Christian. For example, can you imagine parents shunning their teenage daughter, a victim of child sexual abuse, because the local elders demand that she treat her unrepentant abuser with respect and honor. This is not a hypothetical scenario. This has happened in real life, repeatedly. Evidence given at the Australia Royal Commission bears that out. Jesus warned us about such behavior from those claiming to worship God. At John 16one 4 he tells us, I have spoken these things to you that you may not be stumbled. Men will expel you from the synagogue. In fact, the hour is coming when everyone that kills you will imagine he has rendered a sacred service to God. But they will do these things because they have not come to know either the Father or me. Nevertheless, I have spoken these things to you that when the hour for them arrives, you may remember I told them to you. The Bible does support expelling unrepentant sinners from the congregation. However, does it support shunning them? And what about someone who isn't a sinner, but simply chooses to leave the congregation? Does it support shunning them? And what about someone who happens to disagree with the interpretation of some men who have placed themselves in the role of leaders? Does it support shunning that person? Is the judicial process that Jehovah's Witnesses practice scriptural? Does it have God's approval? If you are unfamiliar with it, let me give you a thumbnail sketch. Witnesses consider that some sins, like slander and fraud, are minor sins and must be dealt with in line with Matthew 18, 15-17, at the sole discretion of the injured party. However, other sins are considered to be major or gross sins and must always be brought before the body of elders and dealt with by a judicial committee. Examples of gross sins are things like fornication, drunkenness, or smoking cigarettes. If a witness has knowledge that a fellow witness has committed one of these gross sins, he is required to inform on the sinner, otherwise he becomes guilty as well. Even if he is the only witness to a sin, he must report it to the elders or he may face disciplinary actions and him, action himself for concealing the sin. In an odd twist of reasoning, if he is witness to a crime like rape or child sexual abuse, while he is still required to report it to the elders, he is not required to report this to the secular authorities. In fact, traditionally, witness have, witnesses have been discouraged from reporting crimes to the secular authorities. Once the body of elders has been informed of a sin, they will assign three of their number to form a judicial committee. That committee will invite the accused to a meeting held at the Kingdom Hall. Only the accused is invited to the meeting. He can bring witnesses, though experience has shown that the witnesses are not always granted access and any access they are granted is restricted to their testimony alone. Further, the meeting is to be kept secret from the congregation, allegedly for reasons of confidentiality on behalf of the accused. However, this is not really the case as the accused cannot waive his right to such confidentiality. The accused cannot have an open and public meeting, nor can he bring friends and family as moral support. In fact, no observers are allowed to witness the proceedings, nor are any recordings or any public record of the meeting to be kept. If the accused is judged to have actually committed a gross sin, the elders determine whether he or she has demonstrated any signs of repentance. If they feel sufficient repentance has not been demonstrated, they will disfellowship the sinner 
and then allow seven days for an appeal to be filed. In the case of an appeal, the disfellowshipped one will have to prove that either no sin was committed or that true repentance was indeed demonstrated before the Judicial Committee at the time of the original hearing. If the Appeal Committee upholds the verdict of the Judicial Committee, the congregation will be informed of the disfellowshipping and proceed to shun the individual. This means they cannot so much as say a casual greeting to the individual. The process for being reinstated and having the shunning lifted requires the disfellowshipped one to endure a year or more of humiliation by regularly attending meetings so that he publicly faces the overt shunning of all. If an appeal was filed, that will usually lengthen the time spent in a disfellowship state since appealing indicates a lack of genuine repentance. Only the original judicial committee has the authority to reinstate the disfellowshipped one. According to the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, this process, as I've detailed here, is righteous and scriptural and, above all, loving. Every word of what you just said was wrong. Yes, indeed. Everything about that is wrong. Moreover, everything about that is unscriptural. It is a wicked process, and I'll show you why I can say that with such confidence. Let me start with the most egregious violation of Bible law, the secret nature of JW judicial hearings. According to the highly confidential Elder's Handbook, ironically titled Shepherd the Flock of God, judicial hearings are to be kept secret. Only elders are allowed to read the book, they are not to share it with their wives, and not to openly quote from it during a judicial hearing. I used to have two copies, one in Spanish and another in English. When I left the Spanish congregation, the circuit overseer in English insisted I return the Spanish version to him. He literally hounded me over the three years of his visits with us until I finally gave in and handed him my Spanish version. Of course, the Elder's Manual is readily available on the internet and you can download it via a Google search. Yet, they continue to keep it from the rank and file. Here's the relevant quote. The boldface is right from the handbook, often called the Chaos Book, because of its publication code. Paragraph 3. Here only those witnesses who have relevant testimony regarding the alleged wrongdoing, those who intend to testify only about the character of the accused, should not be allowed to do so. The witnesses should not hear details and testimony of other witnesses. Observers should not be present for moral support. Recording devices should not be allowed. Case book, page 90, item 3. What is my basis for claiming this is unscriptural? There are several reasons that prove this policy has nothing to do with God's will. Let's start with a line of reasoning witnesses use to condemn the celebration of birthdays. They claim that since the only two cele birthday celebrations recorded in Scripture were held by non-worshippers of Jehovah, and that in each case someone was killed, then evidently God condemns birthday celebrations. I grant you that such reasoning is weak, but if they hold it to be valid, then how can they ignore the fact that the only secret middle-of-the-night meeting outside of public scrutiny in which a man was judged by a committee of men while being denied any moral support was the illegal trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. By their own warped reasoning, that condemns the practice of secret judicial hearings, does it not? Now, for real Bible proof that a judicial system based on secret meetings where the public is denied access is wrong, one has only to go to the nation of Israel. Where were judicial cases heard, even ones involving capital punishment? Any Jehovah's Witness can tell you that they were heard by the old men sitting at the city gates, in full view and hearing of anyone passing by. Would you want to live in a country where you could be judged and condemned in secret, where no one was allowed to support you, where no one was allowed to witness the proceedings, where the judges could operate outside of public scrutiny. 
On even a cursory examination, it is evident that the judicial system of Jehovah's Witnesses has more to do with the star chamber methods of the Catholic Church during the Spanish Inquisition than anything found in Scripture. To show you just how wicked the judicial system of Jehovah's Witnesses really is, I refer you to the appeal process. On the surface, it sounds like a righteous policy. Give the accused a second chance and all that. However, this policy is only designed to give the appearance of righteousness while ensuring that the decision to disfellowship stands. To explain, let's look at what the Elder's Handbook has to say on the subject. Again, the boldface is right out of the chaos book. Under the subtitle, Objective and Approach to the Appeal Committee, paragraph 4 reads, The elders chosen for the appeal committee should approach the case with modesty and avoid giving the impression that they are judging the judicial committee rather than the accused. While the appeal committee should be thorough, they must remember that the appeal process does not indicate a lack of confidence in the judicial committee. Rather, it is a kindness to the wrongdoer to assure him of a complete and fair hearing. The elders of the appeal committee should keep in mind that likely the judicial committee has more insight and experience than they do regarding the accused. Avoid giving the impression they are judging the judicial committee. The appeal process does not indicate a lack of confidence in the judicial committee. It is a kindness to the wrongdoer, not the accused, the wrongdoer. It is likely the judicial committee has more insight and experience. How does any of that lay the groundwork for an impartial appeal hearing? Clearly, the process is heavily weighted in favor of supporting the judicial committee's original decision to disfellowship. Continuing with paragraph 6. The appeal committee should first read the written material on the case and speak with the judicial committee. Afterward, the appeal committee should speak to the accused. Since the judicial committee has already judged him unrepentant, the appeal committee will not pray in his presence, but will pray before inviting him into the room. I've added the boldface for emphasis. Note the contradiction. The appeal committee should speak to the accused, yet they do not pray in his presence because he has already been judged as an unrepentant sinner. They call him accused, but they do not treat him as one who is only accused. They treat him as one already convicted. Yet all of that is trivial by comparison with what we are about to read from paragraph 9. After gathering the facts, the appeal committee should deliberate in private. They should consider the answers to two questions. Was it established that the accused committed a disfellowshipping offense? Did the accused demonstrate repentance commiserate with the gravity of his wrongdoing at the time of the hearing with the judicial committee? The boldface and italics are right out of the elder's manual. The hypocrisy of this process lies with the second requirement. Notice the double emphasis, boldface and italics. They want to make sure that the appeal committee gets the message. They are not allowed to judge the sinner's repentance. They are only allowed to judge the judicial committee's assessment of his repentance. That always seemed unfair to me when I served as an elder, but it wasn't until long after I left that I realized it was also wicked. The appeal committee was not present at the time of the original hearing, so how can they judge whether the individual was repentant at that time? They have to go by his testimony and that of the three elders on the judicial committee. Remember, there, are, there were no observers allowed at the original hearing and no recordings were made. The disfellowshipped one has no proof to back up his testimony. It is three against one three appointed elders against someone already determined to be a sinner. And in case the appeal committee has any doubts, they are reminded by the case book 
that they are not judging the Judicial Committee and likely the Judicial Committee has more insight and experience. According to the two witness rule, the Bible says, do not accept an accusation against an older man except on the evidence of two or three witnesses, 1 Timothy 5.19. If the appeal committee is not to judge the judicial committee, and if they are to follow the Bible rule, they cannot ever accept the word of the disfellowshipped one, no matter how credible it may be, because he is only one witness against not one, but three older men. And why are there no witnesses to corroborate his testimony? Because the rules of the organization prohibit observers and recordings. The process is designed to guarantee, guarantee that the decision to this fellowship cannot be overturned. The appeal process is a sham, a wicked sham. There are some fine elders who try to do things correctly, but they are bound by the constraints of a process designed to frustrate the leading of the spirit. I know one rare case where a friend of mine was in an appeal committee that overturned the verdict of the Judicial Committee because they saw no grounds for disfellowshipping. They were later chewed out by the circuit overseer for breaking ranks. I left the organization completely in 2015, but my departure began decades earlier as I grew slowly more disenchanted with the injustices I was seeing. I wish I had left much earlier, but the power of indoctrination dating back to my infancy was too powerful for me to see these things as cl clearly then as I do now. We saw shortcomings, but we believed that good intentions would prevail, so we overlooked policy flaws and found ways to work around them. On more than one occasion, I did what I believed was right, even though I knew I'd catch flack for it later during the circuit overseer's visit, and inevitably I did. I wasn't the only one doing this. Unfortunately, They've managed to clear out from the ranks of the elders all those who think for themselves. I know that there are many who look at the governing body members as well-intentioned men who are unaware of the mistakes they are making. They see them as self-deluded, but sincere. I used to think that way myself, but now I think that a better description is provided by Paul. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself keeps disguising himself as an angel of light. It is therefore nothing extraordinary if his ministers also keep disguising themselves as ministers of righteousness, but their end will be according to their works. 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15 It is hard to look at the tragic consequences of the JW judicial system with its shunning policy, which has damaged so many thousands of lives, and not see a correlation with what Paul says to the Corinthians. I could go on showing all that is wrong with the JW judicial system. That can be better accomplished by showing what it should be. Once we learn what the Bible really teaches Christians about dealing with sin in the congregation, we will be better equipped to distinguish and deal with any and every deviation from the righteous standard laid down by our Lord Jesus. As the writer of Hebrews said, For everyone who continues to feed on milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is a young child. But solid food belongs to mature people, who, to those who, through use, have their powers of discernment trained to distinguish both right and wrong. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. In the organization, we were fed on milk, and not even whole milk, but the watered-down 1% brand. Now we will feast on solid food. Let's start with Matthew 18, 15 to 17. I'm going to read from the New World Translation because it only seems fair that if we are going to judge JW policies, we should do so using their own standard. Besides, it gives us a good rendering of these words of our Lord Jesus. Moreover, if your brother commits a sin, go and reveal his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. If he does not listen to them, speak to the congregation. If he does not listen even to the congregation, let him be to you just as a man of the nations and as a tax collector. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. 
Most versions on BibleHub.com add the words against you, as in, if your brother sin commits a sin against you. It is likely these words were added since important early manuscripts like the Codex Niticus and Vaticanus omit them. Witnesses claim that these verses only refer to personal sins, such as fraud or slander, and call these minor sins. Major sins, what they categorize as sins against God, such as fornication and drunkenness, must be dealt with exclusively by their three-man elder committees. Therefore, they believe that Matthew 18, 15-17 does not apply to the judicial committee arrangement, except in the third stage. However, do they then point to a different passage of Scripture to support their judicial arrangement? Do they refer to a different quotation of Jesus to demonstrate that what they practice is from God? No. And why? Because there is nothing there. This passage, Matthew 18, 15 to 17, is all there is from Jesus regarding handling sin in the congregation. So why don't they follow it? Why do they go beyond what is written? In a word, control. Remember, worship is about obeying God. Religion is about obeying men. As we will see, following Jesus' judicial arrangement takes power away from men. They don't want that. They want the power, the control. So they start off trying to convince us there is a distinction between certain sins. Some they claim are minor sins, while others are major sins. You and I can handle minor sins, but only they, the congregation elders, can deal with major sins. But the Bible makes no distinction between sins, categorizing some as minor and others as major. You may recall that Ananias and Sapphira were killed by God for what today we would categorize as a little white lie. Acts 5, 1-11. Second, as we've just said, this is the only direction Jesus gives the congregation concerning how to deal with sin in our midst. Why would he give us instructions on dealing with sins of a personal or minor nature, but leave us out in the cold when dealing with what the organization calls gross sins against Jehovah? Of course, loyalty would keep one from covering over gross sins against Jehovah and against the Christian congregation. Watchtower 93, October 15th, page 22, paragraph 18. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, if you are a long-time Jehovah's Witness, you will probably balk at the idea that all we need to do when dealing with sins like fornication and adultery is to follow Matthew 18, 15 to 17. You will likely feel that way because you have been trained to see things from the viewpoint of a penal code. If you do the crime, you must do the time. Therefore, any sin must be accompanied by a punishment commiserate with the gravity of the sin. That is, after all, what the world does when dealing with crimes, isn't it? At this point, it is important for us to see the distinction between a sin and a crime, a distinction largely lost on the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses. At Romans 13, 1-5, Paul tells us that the governments of the world are appointed by God to deal with criminals, and that we should be good citizens by cooperating with such authorities. Therefore, if we gain knowledge of criminal activity within the congregation, we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to make it known to the relevant authorities so that they can perform their divinely assigned task and we can be free from any charge of being accomplices after the fact. Essentially, we keep the congregation clean and above reproach by reporting crimes like murder and rape and child sexual abuse that are a danger to the population at large. Consequently, if you were to become aware that a fellow Christian has committed murder, rape, or child sexual abuse, Romans 13 puts you under obligation to report it to the authorities. Think how much financial loss, bad press, and scandal the organization could have avoided if they had only obeyed that command from God, not to mention the tragedy, broken lives, and even suicides that victims and their families have suffered from the JW practice of concealing such sins from the superior authorities. Even now, there is a list of over 20,000 known and suspected pedophiles which the governing body, at great financial cost to the organization, we're talking billions of dollars here, 
refuses to turn over to the authorities. The congregation is not a sovereign nation, as was Israel. It does not have a legislature, judiciary, nor a penal system. All it has is Matthew 18, 15 to 17, and that is all it needs, because it is only charged with dealing with sins, not crimes. Let's look at that now. Let's assume you have evidence that a fellow Christian is engaged in consensual sex with another adult outside of marriage. Your first step is to go to him or her with a view to regaining them for the Christ. If they listen to you and change, you have gained your brother or sister. Wait a minute, you say. That's it? No, no, no. It can't be that simple. There have to be consequences. Why? Because the person might do it again if there is no punishment? That is worldly thinking. Yes, they may very well do it again, but that is between them and God, not you. We have to allow the Spirit to work and not run ahead. Now, if a person doesn't respond to your counsel, you may move to step two and take along two or th one or two others. Confidentiality is still maintained. There is no scriptural requirement to inform the older men, nor anyone else in the congregation. If you disagree, it could be you are still being affected by JW indoctrination. Let's see how subtle that can be. Looking again at the watchtower previously cited, notice how they cleverly subvert the Word of God. Paul also tells us that love bears all things. As the Kingdom Interlinear shows, the thought is that love covers over all things. It does not give away a fault of a brother as the wicked are prone to do. Psalm 50, 20, Proverbs 10, 12, 17, 9. Yes, the thought here is the same as at 1 Peter 4, 8. Love covers a multitude of sins. Of course, loyalty would keep one from covering over gross sins against Jehovah and against the Christian congregation. 93 Watchtower, October 15th, page 22, paragraph 18, Love, Agape, what it is not and what it is. They correctly teach that love bears all things and even go on to show from the interlinear that love, love covers all things and that it does not give away a fault of a brother as the wicked are prone to do. As the wicked are prone to do. As the wicked are prone to do? Hmm. Then, in the very next sentence, they do what the wicked are prone to do by telling Jehovah's Witnesses that they are to give away the fault of a brother to the elders of the congregation. Fascinating how they make it a matter of loyalty to God to inform on one's brother or sister when it comes to supporting the authority of the elders, but when a child is being sexually abused and there is a danger of others being abused, they do nothing to report the crime to the authorities. I am not suggesting that we should cover over sin. Let's be clear about that. What I'm saying is that Jesus gave us one way to deal with it, and only one. And that way does not involve telling the elder body so they can form a secret committee and hold secret hearings. What Jesus says is that if your brother or sister doesn't listen to two or three of you, but persist in his or her sin, then you inform the congregation. Not the elders, the congregation. That means that the whole of the congregation, the consecrated ones, those baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, male and female, sit down with the sinner and collectively try to get him or her to change their ways. What does that sound like? I think most of us would recognize it as what today we would call an intervention. Think about how much better Jesus' method for handling sin is than that instituted by the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. First, since everyone is involved, it is very unlikely that unrighteous agendas and personal bias will influence the outcome. It is easy for three men to abuse their power, but when the entire congregation hears the evidence, such abuses of power are far less likely to happen. A second benefit of following Jesus' method is that it allows the Spirit to flow through the whole of the congregation, not through some select body of elders, so, that, so the outcome will be guided by the Spirit not personal prejudice. Finally, if the outcome is to disfellowship, then all will do so because of a full understanding of the nature of the sin, not because they were told to do so by a triad of men. But that still leaves us with the possibility of disfellowshipping. Isn't that shunning? Isn't that cruel? 
Let us not jump to any conclusions. Let us examine what else the Bible has to say on this subject. We'll leave that for the next video in this series. Thank you very much. If you'd like to be informed as videos are released, please subscribe. Also, feel free to like this video if you feel it has benefited you.